how do we make sure that what we're doing is also in an anti-racist frame that is as supportive as it can be for vulnerable populations? How do we amplify their voices so that they're speaking on behalf of themselves? It's just, there's a whole world of work. We need everybody to step into this space and engage with the commission, engage with a a and most importantly, engage with each other, learn from each other and talk with each other. What is the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing? And how can we address this crucial issue head on? Let's talk all about it in part two of a two-part series on racism in nursing with members of the commission right here on this episode of The Nurse Keith Show. Hey there, this is Nurse Keith. This podcast is about you, your personal and professional development, your nursing career, and the healthcare system as a whole. And I'm here to share education, ideas, frequent diatribes, and interviews with some of the most inspiring people out there in the worlds of healthcare, nursing, medicine, entrepreneurship, and beyond. I love having you along for the ride, and I thank you from the bottom of my nurse podcaster's heart for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. If you'd like to help other people find the show, I'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or on any podcast app you use and consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com forward slash nurse Keith. I really appreciate my patrons and anyone who can leave a rating and review. And I especially appreciate you tuning into the show. Please head over to nursekeith.com to find the show notes for this episode. And we are here with three members of the National Commission to Adjust Racism in Nursing. We're here with Cheryl Peterson, Ruth Francis, and Daniela Vargas. And Cheryl, we're going to start with you. And even though this is part two of two, some people might not have heard part one yet. And I want to just ask you to give us this bird's eye, broad stroke view of the commission, what it's about, why it's in existence, and just a little bit of of your reflections on this commission's really important work. Yeah, thanks so much, Keith. It's really a pleasure to be here. So the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing actually grew out of a movement following the murder of George Floyd. And um, the American Nurses Association, along with our colleagues from the National Black Nurses Association, the National Association of Hispanic Nurses, and the National Coalition of Ethnic Minority Nurses Associations came together and said, we need to look at this problem of racism within the profession. What does it look like? Does it exist? Uh, and, And how does it show up in who we are as nursing professionals? So that is a really critical piece of work that we have done for about two years now, and we'll continue on in the next two years. And it also led the American Nurses Association to engage in looking at its own past, its own behaviors, and how we have contributed to racism within the profession. So this is critical work. It is work that we are doing to support our colleagues of color, as well as to um, support uh, allies who are interested in stepping up, stepping in, and being a part of a really important conversation. Mm, Thank you, Cheryl. And you're the vice president for nursing programs at the ANA. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So so you're involved at the ANA as a staff member. So the reckoning that's happening within the ANA is something that you have your finger on the pulse of because it's happening in the organization where you work every day. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really an important piece of work. What we found as we started with the commission is the reality was that ANA's credibility in this space was really challenged Mm -hmm. by us having not addressed who we were as a professional association. And so it became necessary for us to do this work uh, in hand in hand along with the commission that we looked at past behavior. We looked at um, uh, what we needed to communicate to nurses of color to express our, remorse Mm -hmm. and ask for forgiveness. Mm. 
and to hopefully lead the profession and ourselves as an association into a space of healing and growth. So that's really where we were driving when we decided to engage in racial reckoning. Wow. So this is a big, big issue. And it's been on everyone's radar in a really crucial, I guess you could say visceral way, especially the last couple of years since George Floyd. And of course, this is an ongoing issue that we have to keep addressing over and over and over again in our country. And we're focused on the US, of course, but we know this goes beyond our borders, but this is where we live. This is where we're citizens and we're addressing this. And the ANA is an important organization, the Black Nurses Association, the Hispanic nurses, that we have Native American nurses. We have we have a very diverse nursing workforce. And there's there's a lot going on and there's a lot people have to say. And speaking of people having things to say. Ruth Francis, you're the senior policy advisor in the nursing practice and work environment department at the ANA. And would you like to say a little bit just to introduce the survey on racism in nursing that has been conducted and your reflections on what you all have seen so far, kind of going through the data that you've collected? Sure. Thanks, Keith. Yes. Um, so the... Um we wanted to know what the extent of racism was in nursing and really did not have the data to, uh, to support that. And so we started with the um, listening sessions that were conducted between um, February and April of 2021, where we had five sessions that where we gave nurses the opportunity to just put their voice on the table. And, um, you know, nurses were feeling that they were not being heard, that there were advantages that white nurses were being given above nurses of color especially related to careers, um, clinical skills were being questioned, disrespect from their colleagues and, um, and other patients. And, you know, for one nurse, being a part of this listening session was the first time that she had ever been able to share her story. And she had been a nurse for over 30 years. So this really was a great chance for us to get some of that anecdotal data initially, but then to conduct the survey to really get some hard facts from nurses about what was going on in their communities. Um, so we conducted the survey in October of 2021 and wanted to understand what those experiences nurses were, were having, um, especially the nurses that were um, feeling marginalized. We had about just under 6,000 nurses that responded to our survey, 5,600, and um, across the, the nation, definitely um, statistically significant, but you know, geographically diverse from varied backgrounds in varied clinical areas. So we were able to get a very broad base um, of what was going on from nurses. Um, so we, we looked at some of the data just to, to, you know, we had about 1,900 nurses that um, identified as, as um, non-Hispanic white. Again, about 1,900 nurses that were non-Hispanic black, 90% female, not too surprising there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, about 36% of the nurses that responded were 55 years and older, and about 26% that were um, between 45 and 54. So, you know, we asked nurses straight out, do you think that um, there is racism? Have you experienced racism? Have you witnessed racism? And 49% um, nurses um, responded that there was a lot of racism. As far as they were concerned, 45% indicated that there was some racism in the nursing profession. Um, so uh, let's see, a 63% total um, said that they had personally experienced racism, breaking that down by, um, by races, 92% Black, 75% Hispanic, 73% Asian, 28% white nurses. And so, um, you know, the it was definitely an indication that racism existed. Um, 
And when asked if they had tried to challenge the treatment of racism in their workplace, 65% of them indicated that, um, that even though they had tried to challenge it, that um, no change had actually occurred. Um, a total of 57% across all the races had indicated that they had um, actually try to challenge it, but the majority said nothing had uh, changed as a result of them trying to do something about racism in their space. Um, again, we, you know, this was both from the qualitative um, hard facts, but then also from the quantitative perspective, we really um, captured some quotes that nurses um, gave us about their experiences. And I wanna just kind of tell you a little bit about, about those. Um, I felt um, the feeling of inferiority and voicelessness. I have been called the N word by multiple patients on multiple occasions. A lot of times nurses of color with the same credentials as white counterparts looked for recognition or for promotions. I started to question my self-worth and abilities to do jobs below my skill set. I have um, PTSD from the way I was treated and I've seen a therapist and I'm now being prescribed um, antidepressants. We, we did get some positive experience from nurses that had um, tried to intervene that felt that they um, were allies um, for their colleagues of color. Um, and so don't think that, you know, all of the um, quotes and expressions were, were negative. We did have some positive ones too, but by far, even those allies realized that they were, there were opportunities that they had had that their counterparts of color had not. And so, you know, for us, this really reaffirmed that, you know, racism um, did exist, does exist, and continues to exist in, um, in nursing, and that it is harming our, co our colleagues of color. And so this was really a wake-up call for us to, uh, to realize we cannot continue with the status quo, that as um, organizations, we jointly needed to band together to do something about it. Wow. Thank you, Ruth. The, first of all, nurses love data, right? The <laughs> first step in the nursing process is assessment, right? Yes. So we like data because data gives us something to sink our teeth into. And it's not, not that qualitative information isn't important, but we need numbers. And those numbers demonstrate for us that this is real and it's just as real in nursing as it is in the society at large and if we took any slice of society if we took police departments or educators or whatever other industry or profession we want to look at we would likely see a lot of similar dynamics happening but we're all nurses and we're looking at nursing and nursing is the the backbone and lifeblood or whatever metaphor you want to use of healthcare and this is something that really needs to be addressed. And Daniela Vargas, you are a doctoral student at the University of San Francisco's DNP Population Health Leadership Program. And your work focuses on addressing racism in nursing and creating anti-racist nursing practices and workforce support programs for people of color, workers of color. So from your point of view, what do we then do with this data? I know there's a foundational report series that's come out. You know, what do we what do we then do in terms of taking action? And it sounds like in your doctoral work, you're looking at I, what I gather from what I'm reading here is that you're looking at solutions and things we can actually do on the ground. So how do you how do you put all this together for yourself and then bring it out into the world? Yeah, so let me start by talking about the commission's report on racism in nursing. The foundational report, which was released um, not too long ago, really focuses on some of the main areas where racism shows up in nursing. So the report starts off by talking about the history of racism, really talking about how Eurocentric 
um, how whiteness has shown up primarily in nursing and has been elevated and perpetuated in nursing, um, and that how that has had um, serious consequences, especially for nurses of color, in regards to representation, to access, um, to being able to flourish within the profession. And then that then leads into a more contemporary context with what racism looks like now in the 21st century. Now, it's important to understand that there are many facets that impact how nurses are able to move within the profession. Power, privilege, prejudice, how nurses are able to access different levels of support systems within the nursing profession, and then also, especially within institutions, for example, whether it's healthcare institutions, whether it's in educational spaces, whether it's in being able to access grants, all of these things are impacted primarily because of the racism that has been per perpetuated over time with nurses. And so as a result, um, what the commission did is that we brought together experts across from all over the country um, in the different spaces that we were primarily focusing on, which was education, policy, practice, and research. And so these um, policy groups, uh, work groups, were created um, not only to lead um, some initial work on the foundational report, but it was also an opportunity to engage nurses of color across the country. And so primarily the people serving on these work groups are nurses of color. And so this, it's important to understand this work in that context because many times this work has been done without nurses of color at the table. And for the first time in nursing history, we're actually having a voice not only in what needs to be said, um, in regards to our history, but what our present situation is right now. And so the foundational report is um, outlines just, again, the his it starts off with the history of racism in nursing, then it goes into a contemporary context, and then um, it goes into each one of the uh, specific groups, education, policy, and practice, and research. And so this really works as a, as a starting point for the nursing profession to again start to reckon and to understand the impacts that racism has had in nursing and now what do we do from here right what, what's the next step and so our next step is that um, these groups need to come are going to come back together and they're going to work on now actions what do we do with this information because i think where we wanted to start off with is to present the case and to say this is what's happening right now what do we need to do to make things different and better for nurses and so that's what this report is primarily for to understand the context of racism within nursing now the next part of the work is really working on action items and on action and accountability in regards to how do we address racism in nursing. And so in regards to my doctoral work, this is foundational because I will say that um, as I've started to do my work and my doctoral work, um, you know, I, I'll be honest, I, I did have nurses, nurses who have been nurses for decades who told me that this wasn't necessary work. This is, that this is these are things that are not needed for nurses of color. And being myself a nurse of color, I, I am a brown indigenous woman. I, my parents are indigenous people um, from Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, and so as a result, I, as I traveled through my nursing journey, I realized that there was gaps, that not only were there gaps for me personally, but around me in regards to other nurses of color who were, trying to achieve nursing excellence and yet being blocked in different ways, um, either out of the profession um, so that, you know, they couldn't necessarily finish their degrees or um, being blocked from progression within the profession in order to be able to achieve additional nursing excellence as they continued on in whatever part of the profession they wanted to be in. And so I think it's important that we look at this report as a starting point, but there's a lot of work left to do. Yeah. When you use the word foundation 
you know, a foundational report, that's what brings to mind, right? It's like building the foundation of a house. We have to start somewhere. And Ruth outlined all the data, which is, you know, like I said, nurses like data and it gives us something to work with. And then the qualitative information gives us people's actual lived experience. And Cheryl, Cheryl Peterson, from your perspective now, um, when we're looking at actually taking action, we're doing something. I know there's reckoning happening within the ANA, right? And then we have the the larger contexts. So what would you like to add in terms of what has to happen now and where wh- what's the vision for where this could potentially go? And what would you personally or professionally like to see? As a white woman, learning about this as I'm as we're engaged with the commission, one of the most important aspects I think of this work is education and learning, learning how to be in dialogue with each other. And for any, we could give a lot of recommendations. We could say, here's your checklist of what you should do to be an anti-racist. But our reality is, is unless we're in conversation with each other, that checklist is really going to be quite performative and really is not going to reach where we need to be, which is to be able to understand, listen, communicate, and respect each other and what we bring to the profession. So really, the piece around Uh, dialogue and conversation and education is critical to the work of the commission. You're right. The survey tells us it's there. The listening session gave us words of hurt and harm. And the foundational report lays out that this is not something we can ignore. But we still have to engage with our colleague who's standing next to us in our in our work environment or the patient who's in front of us, we've got to have the words and the compassion and the humanity to be able to have the conversation, be in dialogue with each other. So the report really is truly a foundation. Moving from here, we are going to work on creating um, I think some toolkits to help people to engage in this conversation. We, in particular at the American Nurses Association, continue to uh, host and hold many education sessions, which the foundation of those is small group work and being in dialogue with each other and having us grapple with case studies and think about What would I do in that space? What should I do? What should the profession do in order to become truly an anti-racist profession? And we know that in the long run, if we do that, our patients will be better served. Our communities will be better served. And we as a profession will be stronger. ANA's own racial reckoning really is we continue and really are going to move into dialogue with folks like the National Black Nurses Association. They stepped in when we did not. They represented when ANA did not. They built leaders when ANA did not. And so now our conversation is with individual nurses and how we may have harmed them, but also with our ethnic and minority nurse organizations and how we can, in partnership now, move forward to a better place. We also need to deal with our oral history. So there's a project around how do we capture the voices of nurses who have been marginalized in our historical space? We as an association also have to look at our leadership, our own leadership. We've been fortunate. We have had a black man who has been our president. Mm -hmm. He's been on the show. Yeah. Yes, of course. President Grant, who's fantastic. Uh, And but we've also been led by a lot of white women. And so how do we look at our leadership? How do we build stronger leadership that comes into the association and helps to hold us accountable? And in addition, then 
as we are making policies and advocating for things uh, on Capitol Hill to the administration, how do we make sure that what we're doing uh, is also in an anti-racist frame that is as supportive as it can be for vulnerable populations? How do we amplify their voices so that they're speaking on behalf of themselves? And and it's just there's a whole world of work. We need everybody to step into this space and engage with the commission, engage with A&A, and most importantly, engage with each other, learn from each other and talk with each other. Thank you. That's that's really great. And you mentioned ways of. Um, taking action. And Ruth, Ruth Francis, um, I wanted to touch on Project Echo with you. And so you could explain what Project Echo is before we take a break. So could you could you just paint a picture of it and tell us what it stands for and what it's all about? That would be really helpful. Sure. Thanks, Keith. So uh, Project Echo is a um, eight part series that um, connects nurses by creating an education space, but allowing them to talk. And so it's an opportunity to have subject matter experts do a brief didactic on topics. Um, and for us, it was it was going through a series related to racism, racism in the practice, um, how to be an, an ally, how to um, advocate for for um, your felt your colleagues, how to be sure that um, you are talking into the space and being positive with those that you're working with. Um, so these these lectures are brief, but then we also do case based learning where um, breakout groups groups work through a scenario so that they can then put their voices on the table and support each other. We, we realized when we, um, when we had the session on um, racism in academia that there were some professors that had never been able to, to advocate for themselves in that education space. And we know that, that you know, you um, talk to the wrong person or you say something that could be disruptive and that could be your tenure on the line. And so there's definitely consequences for, um, for being an advocate, but we wanted folks to realize that this is the first step where you can put your voice in the table and support each other. So these different sessions give us the chance to not only provide learning and education, but then to also work through a scenario so that that gives you the opportunity to be able to learn some words that you can then take back and use in your own um, environment where it's, where it's needed. And um, the first series of, of eight sessions was very successful and we are looking to do a second part um, starting in September 2022. Great. And will that be publicized by the ANA and all the other organizations? How will people hear about this? Yes, it's there is a link for registration that is being publicized both through the ANA website and on the commission um, web pages, but also by the 30 plus organizations that are all part of the commission. And so there are many ways that you can uh, sign up and, um, and be involved. Great. So when we come back from the break, I'd like to talk about ways in which someone can actually be anti-racist. And I know you have a list, Ruth, of top 10 ways people can be anti-racist. And I would also like to talk about what you all picture really in, in the in the long term, what can come of this and where this can be taken. And I'd also like to address workplaces and schools, schools of nursing and how you all see them playing a part in this and how we can reach them and make sure that this work kind of trickles into those areas of nursing because they're so important. It's where there's a lot of boots on the ground in nursing education and in the workplace. And we've got a very, very diverse workplaces here in the United States where nurses are engaged. So when we come back from the break, we'll be back with Daniela Vargas, Ruth Francis, and Cheryl Peterson to discuss more about the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing. Stay with us and we'll be right back. 
Hey everyone, let's take a quick pause for the cause, shall we? I can't believe we have over 400 episodes of the podcast now, and that's over 400 good reasons to become a patron. If you find value in the Nurse Keith Show, please consider becoming a patron of the podcast at Patreon. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash Nurse Keith. You can always listen for free, of course, but if you'd like to pledge as little as $2 a month, that would be an awesome way to help me cover the costs of producing the show and show your support. And if you can pledge more, you'll receive some cool prizes and premiums as my gift to you. If you'd like to do me the honor of becoming a patron, again, head over to patreon.com forward slash Nurse Keith. I'd appreciate it so very much. Now, let's get back to today's conversation. And welcome back to the second half of the episode. We're here again with Cheryl Peterson, Ruth Francis, and Daniela Vargas from the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing. And thank you to the three of you. This has been great so far. We have some more to talk about. And it's all so important. It's it's hard to even characterize which piece is the most important because there's so many moving parts. So the first thing I wanted to ask Daniela is, in terms of indigenous voices, here in New Mexico, we have a New Mexico Native American Indian Nurses Association. It's very small, but it's active and it's supported by the New Mexico Nurses Association here. So we do have some work happening here in our state. But what's happening in the bigger picture? What do you see? And what are you hearing in terms of Indigenous voices in nursing and healthcare? Well, we know that Indigenous nurses are highly underrepresented within nursing. Uh, we know they make up probably less than 1% of the nursing population nationally. Um, and at the same time, Indigenous peoples have faced many um, you know, series of levels of trauma throughout their their Li- their own individual lives, but also that of their their families and of their um, their tribes of their people. And I think what's important is that as a nursing profession, we also need to really focus on a lot of the atrocities that they have experienced throughout the founding of this country and even before it. Um, and how just mass genocide has really um, destroyed their populations. And in a way, right, like I said, being that n- Indigenous nurses make up less than 1% of the nursing population nationally should really bring us concern um, in regards to the racism that Indigenous nurses uh, face. Now, mind you, I can't necessarily... Um, it's, you know, uh, talk on behalf of Indigenous nurses um, here in the United States, only because my own level of complexity is that um, I'm an Indigenous nurse, but my people are from Mexico. And so even within the context of the Latinx nursing uh, contextualization of how nurses are represented in this country, there is an erasure um, within the Latinx community of both Afro-Latinx nurses, also Black nurses who are Latino, um, and also um, Indigenous Latinx nurses as well. And so there's a lot of erasure in regards to the complexities of colonialism and colorism that occurs within the Latinx community. And so that's also an issue that many times isn't discussed in regards to racism, because the complexity of that is even deeper um, due to the overexposure of the colonialism that has been forced on our people. Um, And that also is the same for indigenous peoples in America. We have a wonderful um, subject matter expert in our uh, research work group, uh, Lieutenant Sonia Frazier, who has been very vocal about um, looking for ways to amplify the ner- the voices of Indigenous nurses um, as she belongs to the um, Oklahoma uh, State Association of ANA. And so 
she has been working diligently um, with her people as long as well as with other um, indigenous groups um, to elevate those voices because it's important for that to be heard considering that again just indigenous nurses just make up a small population of the nursing population and and that doesn't allow them to have representation at the table and it's about time that they do have representation as well as an opportunity to ask for accountability of the lack of resources and funding and support systems in order for them to flourish within the nursing profession. Right. And even if it's a small percentage, every percentage matters, even if it's half a percent, right? Absolutely. And here in New Mexico, you know, that percentage is quite small as well. However, we have 16 Native American Pueblos in northern New Mexico with three language groups among them. So it, it's a complex um, society within the society that needs to be looked at. And we were trying to attract more indigenous people into the profession here in our state. So, and if we're going to attract them into our profession, what are we attracting them into? And what are they going to be facing when they come into our profession? So these are all questions we need to be asking ourselves. And I wanted to to throw this one at at Cheryl. And then I have an important question for Ruth. Cheryl, I just mentioned, you know, say we're bringing in indigenous, more indigenous people into the nursing profession, and then they're going through nursing school then they obviously have to go into workplaces, whether it's on a reservation or it's off a reservation in the city, in the suburbs, rural area, doesn't really matter. This happens everywhere. So the ANA is doing its reckoning, the commission's issuing its reports. There's going to be a lot of education. So (laughs) we have to reach the schools. We have to reach the workplaces because that's where people are hanging out. That's where people are doing their work and getting educated. And then that's where they're earning their living to support their families. So how do we take this work from the place where it's happening and where we're educating individuals? And hopefully there's leaders and CEOs and CNOs tuning into this. But how do we then bring anti-racist strategies and practices to workplaces and nursing schools? What do we do? How do we build it into curricula? How do we get workplaces to say, hey, oh, wow, yeah, we really need to address this and not just on a brochure? Why, really, really important question. So involved in the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing is both the National League for Nursing and the American Association of Colleges of Nursing, and I might add the National Association of Associate Degree Nursing. So they are at the same table and they too have their own body of work. In particular, I would commend both the NLN and all three, I'm sure, are engaged in this conversation already. So now they're they're bringing it into the broader nursing community, uh, community, but they know they have work to do. And I think they are working very hard to try and bring that into the faculty development piece, the dean development piece, and, and really trying to... Um, create spaces where our student nurses of color can thrive. Uh, It is part of a larger system, and we haven't really talked about systems, but all of this is systemic, right? So nursing schools are part of a system that they themselves have been steeped in colonialism, steeped in um, racist behavior that has now become policy. So it's really hard. We've got to dismantle that policy framework that is impacting our nurses while we're also dealing with our deans and our faculty to address the issue. The same holds true, actually, in our work environments, right? 
We have uh, the Association of uh, the Organization of Nurse Leaders. The American Organization of Nurse Leaders is a part of the commission. Again, trying to bring along as many people into this dialogue as we can. But again, it's a systemic problem and we have to come to it with systemic solutions, which means ANAs and the commission are not going to be able to solve this alone. We've got to engage with the American Hospital Association. We've got to engage with the uh, Healthcare Finance Management Association. We've got a whole host of people who all have to embrace that this is a problem that we have to address. But one by one, we're going to do it with our nurse leaders, with our educators, with our faculty, and each one of us is in individual nurses. Now, ANA as an organization, as the professional association for all registered nurses, in June, we did pass a racial reckoning statement. And that statement is our first foray, our first acknowledgement of past actions that have impacted the profession. And we are starting on a journey to the future. In It is our hope that with this statement, that it reflects the sincerity of this apology, and it serves as the underpinning for forgiveness. In it, what we do is we acknowledge some of the issues where we have been racist in the past. First and foremost, we did not allow nurses of color to be members of ANA. Until about 19, I'm just trying to look here at the number 1948, Mm -hmm. and actually uh, it was longer than that. So we had real work to do as an association. We made it difficult for nurses of color to engage with us. We did not, as I noted before, we did not bring our leaders along and bring in nurses of color of leaders. And in fact, if I could just quote, Dr. Lorianne Sams, who was a president and founder of the National Black Nurses Association, what she essentially said is they're happy to take our money, but they don't really want us to be at the table. And we're turning that around and making it be a real association that reflects all registered nurses. This statement is going to be it's public. Please come and look at it. Know that it is not perfect. We are learning as we go, and we are open to hearing from all of our nurses as we seek forgiveness and we look for healing within the profession. Mm, thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, that's that's a really positive outlook and way to to frame kind of like the the bird's eye view of what what we'd like to see: reconciliation, healing, and action. Because actions are. <laughs> that's where the rubber hits the road. And speaking of actions, Ruth Francis, I know you have a list of top 10 ways to be anti-racist and it's coming out or has come out in an infographic. And we've been talking about systemic issues, right? And the systemic is important because it's deep and it runs deep through our society, through healthcare and obviously through our profession, which is what you all have actually been focused on these last few years. But then when we come to an individual person like myself, for instance, or any nurse saying, okay, so I really want to do my part in the workplace and at home and in at the store and anywhere I happen to be in any organization, what can I actually do? as an individual, how, what are the ways in which I can actually be anti-racist? Could you frame that for us and maybe give us a few, a few pieces of wisdom here? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the average nurse when asked would probably say, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a racist, but then placed in a, in an uncomfortable position, they, um, they may not speak up or they may not know what to say. And, and, you, you know, you can be a racist and not even say anything. And so we really wanted nurses to, to be, um, 
to be willing and able to step out of their comfort zone and still speak for those that do not have a voice. We developed this infographic as part of our Navigate Nursing webinar series last year. Um, when, when that series, that session was on um, how to be uh, how to not be a racist, what does racism look like? And, um, and so we developed this infographic as a way for nurses to just kind of have an idea, what are some of the steps that I need to take? And, um, you know, it's, it's the several points, but it, but it starts with, you know, are you listening, how to listen and to learn from others by, by being quiet and, and, and moving that um, towards that direction. Um, how to be genuine, how you must be genuine in your intentions of what you want to do towards being an anti-racist. Um, not to label folks, um, see people as people and, and enjoy and be a part of that process. Support those that um, do not have a voice or that may be powerless and uplift them. Be authentic, be genuine in what you, um, you want to do. And, you know, and most of all, to, to learn and grow in the process. And it is a process. You don't instantly go from being a racist to not being a racist. It definitely is a journey. But, but there are so many that don't even have the chance to, to be at that table, as we have said, to be a voice for their, um, for their community, for themselves. And so being able to kind of manage your perception, but also learn from the experiences and grow and therefore uplift others is the steps that you, that you really um, need to take. And, you know, and as you look at amplifying being, you know, not being a racist, you're then moving through as you are learning and, and you have your own education to it being um, in the system as so many others that you are a part of in your group or your committees are then able to collectively work towards anti-racism within their healthcare system. So that's really the journey that we want folks to take. Wow. There's, there's a lot of work to do, obviously, on many, many levels. And, you know, each individual obviously has to decide for themselves what they want to do mm -hmm. and how they're going to respond when they witness or, or um, racism in their workplace or anywhere. It could be at the store. doesn't really matter. Um, could be in their own community. It could be at the parent teacher association. It could be anywhere. It could be in the government, local government. And that's why we want more nurses running for school board or school council or running for mayor or being a member of Congress, for instance, or the state legislature. This is, that's one of the levels at which I feel like nurses can have a greater impact in society as a whole is holding public office. I mean, it's not something I plan to do at any point in my life, but there are people out there with that interest. And the New Mexico Nurses Association were always encouraging people to consider something like that or sitting on the board of a nonprofit, for instance. There's lots of places where we can make our voices heard, where we can infiltrate. So we don't have to just work within our profession. We, we're citizens and we have families and friends and you know we we move through lots of different places within the organizations that in which we're in which we participate and um daniela would you like to add something to this portion of the conversation i did i want i just wanted to add you know that it's not only just being in leadership roles right in the government or in other organizations, but I think even, even just right down to being that nursing student who sees something while you're in nursing school and saying, you know what, this doesn't feel right. And rallying those colleagues around you that can also say this isn't right. Um, or being a faculty member and talking to your fellow colleagues and making them aware of some of these policies or procedures, um, things that have been normalized and have created harm to nurses of color, even just down at the very 
bottom of right of mm-hmm. what the system is um, or at the workplace right and saying you know someone's acting racist with a colleague and being an ally and speaking up all of those things have profound impact on the profession because one nurse that experiences racism i mean this is not just an isolated issue. This is happening all over our profession in the many spheres that we're in. And unless we collectively say we are not going to tolerate this in the profession anymore, and there will be accountability. And for those who do not want to um, look at things in an anti-racist praxis, then there will be accountability in the profession. This is no longer going to be tolerated. And that's what we have to say as a unified profession, because, you know, um, Cheryl shared, you know, that the reckoning statement came from ANA, which was absolutely necessary to move ANA into now a new phase of its history um, into the work that they're going to be doing. But you also have nurses across the country who will say it's not far enough. It's not enough. Where have you been? We've been here all this time. We've been saying it. And then you have nurses on the other side of the spectrum who will still say that racism doesn't exist in nursing. Absolutely. And we'll hear that anywhere we go. Absolutely. But but that's why, but that's why, right? We have to do this work and it has to be ongoing and it's going to be continuous. And not just because this report came out mm-hmm. or statements come out, you know, there's work that is left to be done and it will be carried on through generation, but it will be work that will be continuous and um, lasting on the profession. And, you know, I think one of the biggest things that I tell people when they have critiques on either side is if we don't do this work now, when will we start doing it? Mm -hmm. It needs to be done now. Yeah. If not now, when, if not who, right. If not us, who's going to do it. Right. And thank you. And Cheryl, as we, begin to wind down here the reports out you know there's the the data has been collected the first this first big big round of data from almost 6000 people like Ruth pointed out when she went through a lot of the data for us in December of 2022 there's some recommendations coming and then we move into next year so what can we expect in 2022 and where will we be seeing this information Yeah, thank you so much. And may I just add, one of the most important things that the commission did was we named it. We said we're talking about racism. Mm -hmm. We were really clear that we were talking about racism. And we've heard from others that said, well, what about all the other isms that are out there, all the other ways in which we discriminate against people? Mm -hmm. Yes, we know they're out there, but we needed to tackle racism in order to be the most ethical profession that we hear year after year after year from that Gallup survey. We, in order to truly live into that, we needed to tackle racism. So what can you expect moving forward? The commission continues. It's been in effect for two years. We are going to probably shake it up a little bit, put some new membership on the commission starting in 2023. Uh, I believe that the focus of that group is going to shift a little bit, right? We've done that foundational work, but now what we really have to tackle is how do we bring more people into the movement How do we engage more in our dialogue and our conversation? How do we educate more so that they are able to engage with colleagues and systemically? And um, also then begin to build out some of the competencies, right? What's And, you know, we're nurses. We like competencies too. We like data. We like competencies. But what are the competencies? What are the things that nurses need to have in order to be able to be anti-racist? What's the skill set that they need? How do we build that skill set? Um, how do we continue to hold ANA and the rest of the profession accountable? What does that look like? Hmm. Uh, And how do we hold employers and education accountable? What does that look like? And then how are we as a profession going to engage in the bigger conversation around racism? And it's, it's all part and parcel of the same thing. We've got to go 
to our nurses that are on the front lines, and we have to move up into our communities. We have to move up into a whole host of different ways in which racism shows up absolutely every day. And we will get better. We will move our society along and to our own hearts and minds. We'll move healthcare along and we'll move the profession. Well said. Thank you so much. And I can't thank the three of you enough for being on this episode and wrapping up this two-part series for us, which I hope people will really take in and internalize and then externalize in the work that has to happen out there in the world. But it has to happen within ourselves first, right? And then we, we bring it out into the world once we've educated ourselves and done the reconciliation we need to do internally in our own work. So I really appreciate it. And this is really important work. And I look forward to revisiting it in 2023 and moving forward with you all to see how we can continue to amplify the voices of the commission. Thank you all so much. Really terrific. Thank you, Keith. Really appreciate your, your, your willingness to help us to get the word out. Uh, it's, it's hard to break through these days, but I think it's groups like yourself and the work that you do that's going to help us really kind of break through. So thank you. Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nurse Keith Show. Remember, the show notes will be at nursekeith.com. Please check them out. We will have links in the show notes and you can also see those in whatever podcasting app you're using to access the show. I hope you feel uplifted and empowered from this episode. Please consider taking inspired action every day in the interest of your personal professional development, as well as the issues we've talked about here in this series. If you need personalized holistic career coaching, look no further than nursekeith.com. Mention the show, you can get 10% off your first coaching package. And please be, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com. I'd really appreciate your support. The Nurse Keith Show is a proud member of the Health Podcast Network at healthpodcastnetwork.com. We're adroitly produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting. And Mark Cappy Speeson is our stalwart social media ringmaster and newsletter wrangler. Before we say goodbye, I'll leave you with this quote by the musician Robert Fripp, one of my favorite quotes. May my living honor my parents. May my living repay the debt of my existence. Be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico. Ruth Francis saying arrivederci from? From um, Silver Spring, Maryland. All right. And Cheryl Peterson saying adios from? Also in Silver Spring, Maryland. And last but not least, Daniela Vargas bidding us adieu from where? San Francisco, California. All right. Thank you to the three of you. Thank you to the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing for doing this important work. And we will catch everyone on the proverbial flip side.